Okay, everyone, I have a confession to make. Here is what caught my eye. I'm going to zoom in here a little bit. I'm not holding the tri or I'm not on the tripod. So I'll try to hold this real steady. See that? City artificial ice plant. I mean, when there's artificial ice, well, back when my mother was growing up, they had a underground cooler. She lived right on the Yellowstone River. And every year when the ice would get thick enough, there would be men that would come out and they would saw that ice into blocks. And they uh, had a buzz saw on the farm ranching operation that they had there. So they produced a lot of sawdust and they used sawdust and between those blocks of ice in that ice cellar. Oh, there we go. There's Union Pacific train going right there. I guess what my mother dealt with in their ice cellar uh, was real ice. <laughs> it was not artificial, it was naturally produced. So I thought, well, okay. So if you freeze water in big chunks and uh, sell it for people to put in their ice boxes, that was the early refrigerators of the day. Well, that, I suppose you could say that was artificially created ice. They had to freeze that water into those big blocks. And then on this side of the building, it says city power plant <laughs> in Kimball, Nebraska. And those things you see sticking up on the side of the building, those are mufflers and the silver thing that you see down here this is an air filter for intaking air and a huge diesel engines. In the very beginning, I was going, wow, this is an old facility. Maybe there's some original stuff in here. So I wound up going around and making contacts and was able to record this video earlier today. But I thought it was important that you guys would see the same thing I saw when I came to this intersection. And as we go along in the following video, uh, there is a fellow that kind of takes us on a guided tour through there. He talks about how the building has been extended. And you can see one of those extensions right there. And the ice plant actually was on this side of the building. This is the original part of the building. And then that extension that was built in later on has a very large, 16 cylinder diesel engine that is the main power generator. It was first put in, I believe, by some uh, private investors. It was a privately owned company when all this was first built, but I believe it was something like two years later, the city actually bought it and operated it for quite some time, and it's still belongs to the city, but it no longer supplies continuous power. Now in the video to follow, there will be a mention that the engines are started up once every year to see whether or not a certain amount of electricity can be produced in emergency situations. And you'll hear about some of that emergency situation later on in this video. Uh, I know it's going to be a long one. I'm going to have to find some way to cut down and stuff because I actually spent an hour in there covering all of the things that you're about to see. So uh, if you're willing to hang in there, I sure do appreciate it. And once I get to editing this, I'll figure out exactly whether or not I need to split this up into one or more several parts so I'll end it for here and we'll continue on to the next segment there you are you're Larry right yes okay great I'm glad that we were able to make contact uh, I met Nate a little bit earlier and he told me about you uh, he currently works here and he told me that you know more about the history of this building than possibly anyone that is still alive 
and Kimball. Yeah, there might be some others, but yeah, I, okay. know, I know a lot. But you've taken the keen interest in yes. researching, yes. doing a lot of research at the local buff, library. So. Yes. Are you a member of the County Historical Society as yes. well? Yes, I'm uh, okay. a board member of the Plains Historical Society. Okay, very well. Well, I just pointed out to the viewers why I was just stunned when I drove by this building and saw the signage out on the front and I'm going, what, a power plant and an ice plant together? So, uh, Larry, are you willing to kind of give us a little bit of a tour Absolutely. and uh, and uncover some of the amazing historical mysteries or whatever yeah. uh, in your research? Yeah, I've, I've researched as much as I could. Uh, I used to work here at the power plant for the city. Yeah. Uh, the building, original building, which is this part was original. Um, Say like from yeah, where from, this pit is? Right, from the pit over to that wall and right where I'm standing. Okay. Um, you can actually kind of see what, remnants Probably about before. 60 feet? Yeah, probably. Or so, and then we've got another 60 feet going this yes. way, I guess, to the east wall. And, and I don't know what was all in here originally. Uh, it was the power plant and the ice plant. The, uh, this room here was the generating area. Okay. Uh, from what I understand, it must have been uh, steam powered, uh, coal steam powered okay. uh, generator. It was very um, small output. I mean, compared to today, it was, yes. you know, a little Honda generator would make more power. Yeah. Uh, pretty amazing. And then in the upper area up there, I think, was the ice plant. Uh, there's nothing of that okay. still where original this ramp is yeah where here. this ramp is okay i think this ramp and door was probably put in later because um, okay. this room was probably isolated from the ice because this would have been hot and that would have right. been cold right and they got really thick walls and okay. then there's a door on the other side that went out to a loading area with a crane for the ice okay and well there should be uh, some sort of uh, refrigeration coilage or something of that nature to build these huge blocks of light of ice yes which i think were somewhere around the neighborhood about five five and a half feet tall and possibly uh two and a half feet yeah uh in in width and i i actually just yesterday talked to a, a co-worker where i work now that he said his mother actually came here and picked up ice with her grandfather okay and uh they said the blocks weighed 100 pounds, so whatever an ice okay. block 100 pounds was. Right. And uh, she remembers the big ice picks that, yes. that drove into the sides to lift it. Oh, yes, yes. And uh, they said it would last quite a while at home in the, in yeah. the ice box out at the farm. Yes. So, and so my, what I've always thought, and I guess what I've uh, seen in photographs too, is they would make these huge, huge ice blocks mm -hmm. uh, and We'll probably see a little bit later on where there is a traveling crane. Mm -hmm. Crane, is that the proper yep. term? That's okay. Uh, that would have lifted those blocks up. And then uh, I was unsure as to whether there was a contractor then that would buy those big blocks and possibly saw it into pieces and yeah, more manageable pieces that I would actually not, fit in people's ice scooters. Yeah, I do not know how that worked. Um, I know he okay. said they bought them as the 100 pound blocks and they right. they would fit in their, you know, yes. generally farm yes. ice box. Yeah. Um, and I know there's other farms around here that had ice houses mm -hmm. where they would mm -hmm. put large blocks of ice in. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I know they, in one of the engineering things I saw, it actually stated who won the contract that year for ice delivery. So they contracted out the delivery. Okay. Yeah. So, that's what I was kind of yeah. thinking of, where and I don't the big know blocks if, wind up being smaller blocks, yeah. small enough to fit into people's. Yeah, and I don't know if they uh, broke them down here or if they broke them down. Right, right. There. Well, it sounded like uh, the woman would come here to do that. So maybe they yeah. uh, did have some in-house pickup. Yeah. All right. Well, and so there's really nothing left of nothing any left of that the refrigeration. Uh, the oldest okay. things here are probably the crane. You know, and of course, the, okay. this part of the structure, right? Um, where we're standing, used to be power units. Um, I saw pictures that are in the historical um, county book, yeah. where there was like four different units in here, smaller ones, yeah, uh, from the 20s and 30s. Okay. And then when uh, 
that part of the building was added where we have four power units now. Uh -huh. That was added in 30 or 31. I see. And there was two power units or, or uh, generating units put in then, um, a five cylinder and a three cylinder. Okay. And uh, I don't, the last one of those was taken out in the 60s when the, the two on the right were put in. Okay. Um, but it hadn't run in years. Um, there is one of that type of unit actually still in existence in Wisconsin, mm -hmm. and they run it at the state fair or something. Huh. And okay. it takes a lot of air pressure to start it. These are started with compressed air. Okay. These you can start on about 100 pounds to 150 pounds of compressed air. That one takes 1,000 pounds of compressed air. Oh, wow. So you got wow. to have a pretty good compressor to get there. <laughs> yeah, and then you had some had to drive that compressor with something yeah. well, the, as well. They were those engines were built with their own compressor. Okay. But once you lost air, you had no way of building it back up. There you go. They so, built up that and pressure. And that's why they put two in, the in there so they could hopefully always keep one running so they ah, could build air. Makes sense. Makes yeah. sense. But then later they were taken out and these more modern units put in. Right, right. Now the original <laughs> equipment they would not have been as large as this. And it looks to me no. like there are turbochargers yes. on all of these engines. Would yeah. those in engines have been turbocharged as well? No, the earlier ones wouldn't have been. The ones that used to sit here yes. um, were two-stroke diesels, um, and they were all naturally, naturally aspirated. Okay. Uh, that company did later make some supercharged ones, but okay. I, I never saw any evidence that they had any of those here. Okay. And then when they put this unit in, which is the oldest one here, okay. uh, Superior. Uh, this was before White Bottom, so this is a, uh, I can't remember the company that owned Superior then. Na National Supply is who owned Superior at the time. Okay. And Superior's been around since the early ages of, of uh, piston engines, a lot of single cylinder engines used on farms were superior. Oh yeah, like on the, in the hit and miss engines? Hit and miss engines, they okay. made a lot of stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. But these were some of their largest ones and they built these from the 40s clear through into the 70s. Hmm. And it was basically the same design. Okay. And they went all, all over the world. I had records where they were in North Africa and I mean, South wow. America, they went everywhere. Okay, do you uh, think uh, these were engineered specifically for the generation of electricity or would they I, I have do wound believe up these are because the, uh, these engines from what I can tell were never used in a ship okay these were only um, generating engines generator. and they were not used in uh, locomotives either okay. uh, the company that made um, the other two engines that were over here mm -hmm. some of their engines were railroad engines I see so but these and these are all the basic same size Mm -hmm. But as the as the newer ones were built, they had larger turbos, larger injectors, larger intercoolers, and so they they have more output. I see. So this has the lowest output of anyone that's still in the building. I see. Uh, compared to these, and these okay. two were put in next as a pair, and then the last two as a pair. Okay. And, now uh, I have seen uh, similar generators before. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, uh, I have a video of. Uh, steam powered generator mm -hmm. and actually there were four units that uh, provided all the electricity that was needed for a, a copper smelting plant oh right and that used to be in oklahoma um, and that's probably what was something like that it was probably what was in here first when it was coal-fired steam yes so. yes but just the size of these generator units mm -hmm. uh look much like what was being used at that refinery right. had I noticed uh, just by looking at some of the wiring on these generators it appears to me that uh, that is three phase yes of alternating current rather than DC current yes so they, they basically it's not really a generator it's an alternator well and that's a generator <laughs> yes and that, that would that that's the DC exciter right that runs the AC alternator in order yep. to keep the and AC so when, alternator from going. the from the control panel you control the only the exciter okay and it yes. controls the alternator yes yes and then this these generate 2400 volt three phase that's okay. what, the rate they they generate all right. That. all right all six units in here are well no the 
the big Cooper generates at a higher one, and it has it's okay um, because our our grid here in town they raised the voltage. Okay. Town used to be 2,400 volt everywhere, okay. and then stepped it down. Now it's uh, you're going to test me here. <laughs> <laughs> Can't remember the voltage. Thir 13, 470 or something it is okay. now. And that's now what, would that be on each hot leg? Since well, no, that's on the that that's the, on the highest highest level of the power poles in town, and then they have transformers that step it down. Oh, right, 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 right. Okay. So, yeah, well, but, that, the, but when you have higher voltage, you have yeah. less voltage drop, and so right. having a higher voltage run around town instead of right. 2400 right. is more efficient. Yes, and uh, it may have a, a similar amperage, even though you're upping the voltage, what you're actually doing is lowering the amperage, uh, which causes a lot of resistance. So mm -hmm. you can use smaller wire right. to carry uh, that extra energy through right. voltage. Yep. Uh, all right. Well, and, uh, and these all, like I, you mentioned, they're all uh, have turbochargers on them. Yes. And and intercoolers. This one, of course, is our smallest intercooler because it's the lowest output. So it has an intercooler. Okay. Um, the uh, exhaust is actually a tuned exhaust. You hear tuned exhaust used in racing. Oh, yeah. These are tuned We're, exhaust. It's eight cylinders into four. So okay. there's only two cylinders going to each one of those four manifolds blowing in the turbo. So it's, right. so it's efficient airflow into the turbo. And wow. these were all designed in the 40s. Incredible. And then since we're in modern technology, if you look up here, these are actually EPA rated, and that's a catalytic converter that was added. Oh, wow. So we can wow. run these today. They're legal to run because they all have catalytic converters on them. Well, I'll say. And they still burn diesel. I they presume. still burn diesel. Now, these were all designed as dual fuel. Okay. Um, so they could run on, on natural gas. Okay. Um, that's what these oh, yeah. regulators and stuff are for natural yeah, gas. I should have recognized gas regulators. <laughs> and uh, from what I understand, this old unit that was put in 51, we didn't have natural gas in town until 60. Wow. And so this unit, from what I understand, was never run on natural gas. I see. It was, it runs so sweet on diesel, and okay. it's actually very efficient on diesel, uh -huh. so it's never run on natural gas. Wow. The rest of these units all ran on natural gas, because they were put in about the same time that natural gas came to town. I see. Because um, that unit was put in in 1960, the last one of the white superior engines. Oh, yeah. It was put in in 1960. Here's a little informational plaque there. Let me get a shot of that. 360 RPM. Yeah, they all run 360. The RPM is, it determines your hertz frequency of your power outage. Yes. And so they can't vary from that RPM. Yes. So they're governed at 360. Right, right. So. It's 60 hertz, I 60 suppose. hertz, yeah. yes. Let's walk to the. Um, oh, the control center. The control panel. <laughs> This is the control center for the generators, the, the five here. Yes. And then this one was added for the large Cooper on the other side. Okay. That controls it. Back when we were 2,400 volt, then this section controlled the power going out. Okay. And now it's done in a switchgear building behind us. Um, there used to be a, an automatic control here okay. to run town so it would maintain the 60 hertz in the output. And it could vary. It could adjust certain engines yeah. to keep that. Uh, the old engine, it doesn't have any automatic control, so they would just basically set it for one level, to, yeah. to and then the other ones would balance. Oh, I see. And then I, there used to be tags on these, and these were the outgoing because there used to be like nine circuits out of the building, uh -huh. and now town doesn't have that many because the higher voltage doesn't have to have that many circuits. Oh, okay. And so they had feeders. This had up here. Here is still one tag, up to feeder eight there. Okay. So that was the eighth, and there was nine coming out of this building. And then, you know, hospitals kind of important, so they actually kept 
track of what just the hospital used. Yes, yes. So, and uh, keep that circuit alive by all costs. Yeah. I see he's let the battery go dead. There's two clocks on the wall. Oh, yes. One of them's run off the power. Uh -huh. The other one is a very um, accurate battery operated clock. Okay. And so if your hertz frequency gets off very much, your time will either advance or retard. Yes. And so they would actually compare clocks every day. Wow. So. Right. Well, that's the old way to do it. <laughs> wow. And th since this was one of the old, only buildings in the city, we also, at the time, they monitored water pressure. So this is the city water pressure, too. Wow. Now, uh, before I ever came into the building, I saw that there was still existing air intake and exhaust yes. on the outside of the building. And my heart just kind of leapt up in my throat, and I'm thinking, wow, there's likely to still be some of the original machinery in mm -hmm. here, and I would love to see this old-style ice-making equipment, <laughs> which has simply yeah, been torn out of every I ice house was... in North America, right. as far as I can right. tell. I've never been to a museum that... Uh, could show off any of that type of material. Yeah, I wish that was another. here. Yes, yes, I wish yes, that was yes. Here. And, uh, but once I came in here and discovered that there is a reason why the machinery has been updated right. in this building over a period yeah. of time. And I don't know when the ice machine machinery was taken out. Yeah. I believe it was clear into the 40s yeah. that it was still here. Yes. Um, I think the last engineering report that I saw was in the late 30s where they had contracted for um, hauling ice. Okay, and, okay. And, you know, rural electrification hadn't happened everywhere even right. by the 40s. Right. So they still needed ice out in the country, and we're in a pretty rural area, so yeah. ice was still in demand. Definitely. So. Well, now there is a reason... Uh, well, like to say, up through the 60s, 70s, uh, uh, statewide electrical grids had not really been put in place. There are a lot of towns that were still using their own generators to supply electricity for a limited region around the town, generally. Yeah. Sometimes there would be co-ops that would form mm -hmm. and have uh, generation stations in several small towns that might be tied together. Yeah. And then that way they didn't have to have duplicate standby power yeah. uh, at each individual location. Uh, oh. That's what I've learned by researching the uh, the RFO, I think, uh, co-op thing that Franklin mm -hmm. Delano Roosevelt put into play. Yeah. Uh, now, in, in researching the, er, the early stages of this, this place was started in like 1914, right. and it was a private interest. Yeah. And they actually had competition then. The uh, creamery here in town had their own generating okay. um, equipment to generate electricity. And they didn't make ice, which I thought was funny because, you know, you still need, yeah. you know, you're going to get the milk just about that cold. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> and, uh, but they actually competed with this place to sell electricity to customers that were close enough well, to hook it sense. up. Yes, yes. And then the, the early days when it was private, um, the company not only generated electricity, they put up the poles, they run mm -hmm. the wires, they mm -hmm. put everything in the person's home or business. Mainly it was for business to start with. Yes. Uh, the early ads I saw, um, they only ran the plant from dark till 10 o'clock, so businesses could be open till that late. I see. And uh, I, it was interesting, I, um, one of the ads after the place was open said, now c people can work their normal 10 hour day oh. <laughs> and i'm like yeah we don't work 10 hour days anymore exactly you know? but and usually it was it was, it was interesting you know that was it that was the yeah. common then was generally 10 it hour was days. six day week as well and six days a week and they didn't run on sundays yeah so right you know you didn't have any electric wow. you didn't have any electric church organs or you know yeah no late <laughs> night prayer services no, you, that type of thing <laughs> so and then uh so it was pretty limited in the early days. They did have street lights downtown, but of course okay. they would go off at, at 10 o'clock. Um, <laughs> the, uh, 
they I can't remember what they called the ones they put on Main Street because they were different, and then the residential areas they put oh. up regular higher street lights. Okay. Um, and then it, one of the articles in the paper said that everybody should uh, take off their awnings off the front of their businesses, so the light could shine on their business. Oh. And I'm I thought that was interesting yeah. too. You know, just yeah. stuff that I wouldn't think of that right, was in the right. newspaper. But well, then. But then to, to boost their sales of electricity, they also sold electric appliances. And so I saw oh, yeah, ads for yeah. electric vacuum cleaners. Yeah. What was interesting, they showed the cord and the cord didn't have an end on it. But in the early days, um, our, our outlets that we have now weren't yes. um, standard. There right. wasn't any standard. Right. And so whatever, you know, whatever right. town you went in, you had to wire your own plug on the end to fit your outlet because that uh, town might have put in different outlets yeah. than the town. Well, most of the wiring one. back in those days was what is uh, commonly, well, it's known today as knob and, knob tube, and tube Yep, wiring. Uh, didn't have all that manufactured insulation. Nope. On, like Romex Sing, wires. Single insulated wires, yeah. Yes, yeah. I have some of that because my dad bought out an old electrician and I have a lot of I have an old box full of knob and tube and oh, single wow. wire. Wow. And some early um, outlets yeah. too that are different than ours. Yeah. So I could see where, you know, uh, all these homes and businesses had to be refitted to use electricity. So right. I can see where uh, some of that wiring could have been exposed. And, oh, yeah. And uh, at the terminus, uh, there would be just like uh, nut and bolt type terminals. Yeah. the appliances would be wired to directly yeah. rather than a plug-in. That makes sense, yeah. And, uh, you know, most lights, like I had an aunt in um, eastern Nebraska, mm -hmm. and she only still had one light bulb hanging in every room yeah. and no other electricity, and she yeah. still pumped her own water and, uh, and used an outhouse. Okay. And I always thought that was cool. You know, there's this one light bulb hanging in the middle with the pull chain yes. Yes. in every room. All right, well, let me continue on the uh, line of thought that uh, this equipment, all this equipment was, is nope. here. We have lighting overhead. You, you wanted to see, um, I'll show you some of the, you said air filters and exhaust. Oh, yes. Let's step out back and look at one of those. They're, ca they're kind this of This electricity is not coming from these generators. And there no. is a specific reason why these generators are still here. Yes. We're, we're, as far as I know, now I don't work here anymore, we're still back up for the grid. Yep. Um, okay. Yeah. We're, we, yes. still, we still maintain, these are still maintained mm -hmm. to be back up for the grid. Okay. And like several years ago when Texas had the big outage and, yes. and all that stuff, we actually generated, what, three days? Three days. Three days yeah, these, day. these babies ran. Wow. And uh, to generate electricity. Wow. And to, to because the, the grid's nationwide. They can yes. tie in everywhere. Yes. And so, you know, even though that's where the shortage was, we mm -hmm. could push power onto the grid wow. from this little old plant out wow. in the middle of nowhere. So. Yeah, well, Texas has been a uh, big wind power state these yep. days. That was a big embarrassment that well, we, things would Yeah, we have badly. a, the first wind farm in Nebraska was actually north town here. And it's been replaced by the 12 that are out here now, but there were okay. seven towers out there and it was the first wind farm in Nebraska. Wow. So, and it used to tie into this um, location. Okay. So, well, the new one's tied in right to the grid on outside the city. So we got some of the air cleaners and exhaust right here. Okay. And oh, the sun's going to be in a terrible position. Let me get over this way. Now we can see them. Now those those exhausts are new because they are the ones with the catalytic converters built into them. Yes. And so they are not the originals. Okay. The only one that has its original exhaust is the one over there with the with the catalytic converter inside the building. That we saw earlier. Yeah, okay. and it's just a straight pipe. It didn't have a muffler on it. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, wow. So there's the exhaust on top, and then down below, we have the intake. Yeah, these are the air, air cleaners for the same two units. Okay. And uh, they're actually oil bath air cleaners. Oh, wow. 
and they're kind of an interesting design because these panels rotate and they dip down in the oil and then come back up. Oh. They used to do it. Like yeah. Well, they, this, these two still work. Have you ever used them? No, nobody knows anything about it. Okay, I'll show you how to oh, do it. Oh, wow. Because <laughs> uh, we had wow. Robert fix some fans. Yeah. And Larry, I think you need to hire him. yourself out as a consultant. <laughs> he was the, telling us about it, and he was saying a whole bunch of stuff has been disconnected. Yeah, the, the two on the top do not work. You have to manually rotate those. These two will still work automatically. And these two I had completely apart when I worked here because that one tends to get water in it, and so I had to change the oil in it, basically. Hmm. So. Interesting. The, the air cleaner for the Cooper, which is up on the roof, um, it holds 110 gallons of oil. Incredible. <laughs> these don't hold that much, thankfully. Now, we're kind of missing an yeah, these important are, element out here, aren't we? These are the some of the radiators to cool them. Yes. Uh, this this little bitty one here is one of the oldest. Okay. Um, on the other end of this little addition here, that building actually used to be the water well. For the okay. City. And then uh, there used to be a whole row of radiators there, but they were even smaller for the earlier units. Yeah. Then as they upgraded to bigger units, they went to bigger radiators. Yeah, yeah. And then that one was added um, after we quit generating full time. Okay. And uh, because we needed, when, when this plant was running full time just to generate town, they only needed to run uh, two or three at the most four units. Yeah. When we became backup for the grid, we had to have all six available to run at, at capacity. Yeah. Well, we didn't have enough cooling for that, so they added that big radiator just so they could run all six at the same time. Wow, wow. So I and guess that, there's no piping where everything is conjoined yeah, together. Yes. And various water circuits to uh, <laughs> handle yeah, all yeah, the there's capacity. A lot. And we would always, in the wintertime, we don't need it. You know, it's cold enough here that the rest of the radiators would keep it cool. Yeah. So we would always empty that one completely in the winter. Ah, did not resort so, to using antifreeze. No, none of, none of it has antifreeze in it. Wow. So we always had a, we had a boiler that would circulate water through these okay. in the wintertime. Okay. And so they have louvers on top, and then we would close all these doors on the sides okay. to, uh, to try to keep the heat in. Right, right. It didn't work, but we tried. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Things I would have never thought of. Well, I'm actually pretty ignorant about a lot of this technology as well. Yeah. I have toured some more modern power plants. For this, this is the pump room, and these are the, just the water pumps to circulate water to cool the engines. Oh, okay. So the engines don't have water pumps themselves? They do not, they do not have water pumps, okay. no. Okay. And they each have their own electric oil pump to prime them because you don't want to start them dry like you do your car. Oh, yeah. So you prime the oil. We usually run the oil pump for half an hour before we ever started the unit. Oh, wow. So, or as long as you could. Yeah. Depending yeah. on how quick. That's something so. I wouldn't have thought of. And this, this, I guess, doesn't work anymore. This is the boiler. It is used to heat the water to keep it warm in the winter since okay. the, there's no units running. Yeah. When, the, when the plant was running full time, they even had the windows open in the winter because it would get too hot in here. And I so they never worried. They didn't have any freezing issues because yeah. you always had units making heat. Yeah, yeah. Um, a friend of mine used to work for the, uh, or own the gas company that's across the street. Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, if he got cold in the winter, he'd just come over here. <laughs> <laughs> And the noise must be deafening in here. Yeah. yeah. When these engines are I, all I've running. taken videos with the in, units running. Yes. And you can't talk because right. they you can't hear any right. talk. Exactly. <laughs> all you hear is the engine. Exactly. Noise. Yeah. Now, you wear you wear air protection to be in here when it's running. Yeah. Well, since uh, these units are still acting as an emergency backup mm -hmm. for shortages on the grid and all, and all, and it's the state of Nebraska that is driving that initiative not only in this community but other communities yes. who have similar yeah. deals. Well, 
Uh, I understand. And some, some of them have, you know, more modern units. Yes. And so they are the ones they call first. Okay. We're kind of the last line of defense. Oh, I see. If, if they have to call us, it's a bad day. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> save Texas. Because these, yeah, because these, these are not, Texas. you know, these older units running on diesel are not as efficient. If they were right. still running on natural gas yeah. and dual fuel, yeah. they're a little more efficient and natural yeah. gas is cheaper. Right. But it's touchy to adjust the, the fuel yes. running on natural gas. And since they run so sparingly, we just run them on diesel. I see. So um, they can't run on straight natural gas. Okay. Uh, they just call it dual fuel because there's no spark in there. There's no uh, right. spark plugs. Right. And natural gas won't self-ignite mm -hmm. like diesel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so they, when they run them on, on dual fuel, mm -hmm. there's about 15% of the normal diesel load still going in it uh. just to start the spark. And then the natural gas is burnt. We'll go to the Cooper, the big one. Okay. This unit was added in the 70s. Um, and, and that's probably when the building was expanded? When this, yeah, this part of the building was added in the 70s. Like yes. I say, that, this part was added in the 30s. Okay. Uh, the pump room was added at the same time because of the pumps when... When this was built, this part was built in the 30s, the pumps were actually underground right here. Okay. There's actually a cover right there, and there's ah. actually still some kind of tank in the bottom of that. Pit. Oh, okay. I have no idea what it is. I'm assuming water <laughs> it was because they were the water pumps. Okay. But I don't, I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> okay. But then when they were going to put these units in, then they built the pump house. When they added um, the last two, then they built the rest of the switch gear room. Okay. So, wow. But then this was added in the 70s and to house the Cooper, which is by far the largest unit. Uh, it's, it's a 16 cylinder. Um, I always just call it the two story engine because it goes deep into the basement. Yeah, that's why we're, yeah, we're on we're over a grid, grid. Yeah. system here. This is, this is the little bitty oil filter right here. And oh it, goes, my. it goes deep into the basement another five wow. feet. I have not had that apart. Incredible. Um, I can't remember how many gallons this thing holds. This, yeah, 1,100 gallons, I think. Wow. And uh, it only has a sight glass for oil level on the other side. Wow. Um, it is held in the oil pan under the engine. Uh, the other units are all dry sump. They have oil tank and they're dry sump and they're okay. pumped out of the sump. But this one actually has an oil pan like a car engine today. Okay. Um, Do they use a combined sump? Uh, for all the engines over there, or no, each one they have each their, have their own? own. Okay. They each have their own. And this is the business end here. Uh, same, same as the uh, as the other ones. You got your DC exciter and your and your alternator. Okay. Like I say, this one generates at a much higher voltage. Yes. And it goes directly out to the switchgear building. It doesn't go through the building. So there's underground cables from, from underneath that go oh, yeah. actually around the building and out to the switchgear building. And when we power town, this one becomes the lead generator. Yeah. And the other ones float and pick up. Like, if you watch that board back where the hospital mm -hmm. stuff is, the feeders, uh, throughout the day, the power, the need for power increases. So this one would bear the brunt of the load, and then two of the other ones, three of the other ones, whatever's floating, would pick it up. Okay. Oh, now I'm getting a better look at the uh, heads up there. Yeah. Those are massive. Well, it says How here. wide are each one? Oh, it does. Yeah. Oh, okay. Let me see if I can get this into play here. Doing a terrible job, but <laughs> yeah, 15 and a half inch bore, 22 inch stroke. Wow! Again, like the other ones, only 360 RPM, 5,429 horsepower. Incredible! And those heads up there, they look like they're almost three feet wide. Yeah, they're they're huge. These are at least completely self-oiling. Um, all those old engines over there. Uh, all the bottom end is self-oiling, but you have to actually oil the valve train with the oil can. 
So after you, every time we'd start them, we'd get up there and go through and oil all the rockers and, and valves. Oh, wow. So they're a little more labor intensive than working on this one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And now this, and you don't see belts because this one's direct drive. Yes. A lot of the new ones are direct driven yes. uh, exciters. Makes it a little bit more efficient. Yeah. Yeah, then belts in the open there are kind of strange. There, I, I saw a, a picture of some of these older units and I think they were in a plant in New York and they did have everything guarded. And, uh, but these, these never had any. Um, I talked to some of the old guys that used to work here and when they used to run these all the time, um, periodically you got to get down in there and polish the rings and the brushes. Okay. And they would actually do it with them running. They'd climb down in that pit. Oh my gosh. And I'm like, yep, yeah. not happening. I'm not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I have but you know we didn't have we didn't have safety standards back then. Yeah, <laughs> and Nate's the safety guy for the city now, so he's shaking his head. You uh -oh. know, uh -oh. <laughs> stuff like that. You know, was common back then. But if it was, if it was actually ocean control, municipalities aren't right. Yeah, it's recommended. Right. Uh, this place would be shut down. Yeah. You can't have any of those belts exposed like that. Yep. Anymore. I was I when I worked here, I was going to guard some of that stuff because, you know. The ones I saw in that picture were like, you know, that looks pretty cool. And they're, they're hinged, so you could open them up and service the belts if you needed to. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, we never got to that point. But if we actually, you know, let the public in here when it was running, we would have to do all that. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. so, so nobody's sense. allowed in here authorized only when, when the plant's running. Right, right. Because it is, you know, there's a lot of moving parts. There is a crane that goes over this entire building here for oh, the Cooper. Yeah, okay. So you can uh, put, change heads or do whatever you need to on the top of the engine. Well, that would certainly be necessary. I, I'm told I'm there's sure. a crankshaft for this motor laying out here at somebody's farm. Because when this motor was first installed, they had an oil pressure problem and they ruined the crankshaft. Oh my. So the crankshaft was changed while the motor was here and the bad crankshaft's laying out in the country. Wow. I'm sure that thing's not light. <laughs> oh, I know. And I remember it laying outside the building when I was a kid. Okay. But yeah, I guess it's out at somebody's farm now. And that crankshaft would be approximately as long as the uh, the out exterior oh, yeah. of the engine here. Yes. Yes. So it'd have to be. That's just incredible. This this one, the control panels over here. To, to start the engine. Each one of them you have to start at the at the unit. So we have a control panel for it. Oh yes. Well this is certainly the big daddy everything yeah. in here. And then this this is actually the natural gas feed if it was running on natural gas. Uh -huh. That's how big the natural gas line is just feeding this unit. Oh my. <laughs> just this one unit? Yes. It's natural gas just to the one unit. Oh, Lord, I wouldn't want to pay that gas bill. <laughs> yeah. So it looks like you've got some uh, oilers that, there? Part of the no, oilers No, this, this is part of the governor. Oh, okay. This is, this is controlling the fuel. Gotcha. Yeah. And I believe this is, I don't recall anymore, but I believe this is part of a uh, shutdown. Okay. I think that's a, a shutdown deal. Oh, yeah. It'll kick the racks off. Okay. So. And each one of these covers, I, I guess, are inspection ports? Yeah, these are inspections ports? so you can see the, the uh, rod. Oh, yes. yes. Yes, And you have to do, every so often, they have to do a uh, um, deflection test. And you'd have to get in there, and you met, you would measure the crank by rot and rotate it in different positions, because these things vibrate and settle, and even though they're huge chunks of iron, yes, they can give if the concrete gives oh, away. Oh yeah, yeah. And so they they're allowed so much deflection, mm -hmm. and uh, there's the last one on the other side, the last superior, had an issue, and they actually had to rebuild the concrete under it because it kept settling. Oh, they wow. kept getting deflection issues, so they actually had to rebuild underneath it. Wow, wow. So when it was put in in, the, in 60. Okay. So. <laughs> and they only have to do deflection tests so many, every so many hours. 
Mm -hmm. uh, this place doesn't run enough anymore to ever probably need one. Yeah. It was done um, four or five years ago, and so I don't think it'll ever need another deflection test. Wow. Um, so hopefully. The fact that when it snows, water goes in the basement. Yeah. <laughs> but. All right, well, I guess we have one other portion of the building that uh, is part of the ice plant operation that we have not uh, seen as of yet. The empty building. Uh, <laughs> right. And there is something in there that is an original artifact from what we understand. Oh, let's go. And uh, let's evidence go that there are materials that date clear back to the 1800s. And there, there is a crane above every engine. There's a beam straight above every engine. Since these are inline engines, they only need one beam. So there's a crane, so if they had to lift a, a head off or anything, they okay. could do it off each individual engine. Yes. They, they are air start. Um, and these uses air the pressure. For air pressure tanks? This is the air storage and, and okay. compressor to start the superiors. Okay. And uh, the Cooper has its own compressor. And so okay. And, and they I are tied together if one of them leaks. They're all fixed up so that any moisture which collects through that compressing process can be drained out of the right. bottom and there's yep. hoses that carry it to the outside. Yep. The offices are behind that wall. There's two offices. Oh, okay. And, uh, and then this room is what I believe was probably both their maintenance area and where they loaded um, ice. Okay. Because I'm believing the ice room was up on this raised area that's kind of insulated from the rest of the building. That's where the water was frozen to create yeah. the ice. And this was the only doorway from what I can tell. Okay. Because the early pictures have a solid wall there and then they had a, a, a garage door here basically. Okay. And then overhead they have a crane um, which I'm assuming is what they loaded the, the uh, the ice blocks with. Yes. Now this this may not be the the original crane itself, the electric part of the crane. Yeah. But this baby's old and it still works. <laughs> but uh, it may not be the original, but I believe all the rest of the of the gantry is probably original. Uh, and yes. uh, as we discussed earlier, there's places on here where it says Carnegie on the steel beams. And so okay. they're believing they're at least from the late 1800s. I don't know if you can see that Carnegie on that steel, but. There we go. I'm a little bit shaky. I'm not shooting off a tripod here. <laughs> <laughs> and then it, it was repaired once. If you see, there's an extra bracket on that piece. So they broke it at some time. Oh, yeah. But they did a good job of fixing it because I've lifted a lot of stuff with it and never had a problem. It still tracks true. <laughs> and this doorway looks to be approximately six feet tall and maybe uh, three and a half foot wide. Yeah, probably. Yeah, it's approximately the size of the ice blocks that I have yeah. seen. Produced. Yeah, and that, that's what I'm assuming is they wheeled them out on this platform and then used the crane to... Set, yeah. them set them over on the very large wagons, there. carts, whatever you happen to bring in to load ice on. Right, right. So. Well, okay. I just love exploring history like this. Um, and I guess it's very interesting to me that a facility uh, would still be kept alive in mm -hmm. some respect. And that probably wouldn't happen if the state of Nebraska didn't have a plan to utilize well, some of this I, whole yeah, equipment. Yeah, part of that, probably that. There, there's been some people in this town that just didn't want to get rid of it, too. Okay. Um, so there's been some people that that yeah. fought to keep it here. Yeah. Um, and, you know, th they're, I guess, going to add on to it now, put newer generators out back. Okay. So, you know, so I'm assuming that this will stay around. Yeah. And, it, you know, if they ever do mothball the thing i hope they put turn it into a museum and don't oh scrap yeah them. i think that would be great because they are pretty cool so. <laughs> yeah and i would love to see some of those old four cylinder uh yep. steam powered engines in here as well yeah 
you know, just to be part of that museum place piece if they are actually still around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there, there's some other some, older engines that, that of the type that used to be in here uh -huh. that I've seen on the internet okay. that are still run. People have them built on semi trailers oh, and wonderful and start them. They don't have the generators on them anymore. They yeah. just start them as a show. Right. Right. And uh, but there's still there's still some of the earlier ones around. And, and as I mentioned to you yesterday when I talked, yeah. the um, Pine Bluffs, which is uh, 18 miles west of us, mm -hmm. um, they have their old museum and it's in the original power plant building. And they have two of their units in there, their early uh, diesel wow. units in there. Wow. So, and they're four cylinder units and they're all still complete, yeah. um, but they took out all their controls and all that stuff and built a museum in there. Oh, okay. So they're, yeah. but I would almost guarantee you if you would hook them things up to, to fuel and had air to start them, I bet you they would run. Oh, I know. <laughs> I have some friends who are into the hit and miss engines. Yep. And uh, one of them bought an engine that he was told probably hadn't run in a good 80 years. Yeah. And, uh, well, we did a little bit of cleanup on the outside of the thing, make sure it had oil in the oil reservoir, and then we oiled up everything that looked yeah. like it was moving parts <laughs> on the valve system, you know, right. how that goes, and the governor and all that type of deal. And gave it a spin, and it just fired right up. Yeah. Pop, 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 pop. Pop, 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 pop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, th those units up there, I was told by s someone that um, when they used to run their town, they didn't actually have any full-time employees that run the power plant. Wow. And the fire department was in the same building, and basically the fire department ran the power plant. So if the power ever went out, it was basically like fire call. Everybody would run down and try to get the plant back running. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's yeah. a wonderful story, too. Well, is there anything else in particular you can think about? I, I believe this is built, the original part, which is this part, was built around uh, 1914. Mm -hmm. uh, the city took it over in 1918. Okay. And so the city's owned it since then. I see. Uh, it was originally started as a private venture um, from the, I don't remember the names, but it was a man from Denver and a man from Cheyenne that came and like canvassed the community to see if they would be willing to basically buy electricity if they put it in. Yeah. So they, they actually built the original facility for electricity and ice. Wow. And then the city took it over. They had struggles those early years. They had one year they had a coal shortage, I read. They finally got some coal from the railroad so they could run the generators. And of course it was the middle of the winter, um, but most everybody still was um, coal. Right, right. <laughs> Heating their house, but um, so then the, you know, not too many years after it was started, the city took it over and, and began it as I a city, city project. See. And it just kind of grew from there. They added, from one article said a gas generator. I've never found any records of what that might have been, hmm. uh, whether it was gasoline, I'm assuming. Oh, yeah. Um, but I don't know what kind of generator. And then yeah. the earliest pictures I had um, that had the old two-stroke um, from the one picture, I can see a, a four-cylinder, a two-cylinder, and a one-cylinder, and then another four-cylinder, uh, two-stroke diesels. Okay. And they were all over in that open area yeah. uh, before you got to that 51 engine. Okay. So. Well, thank you, Larry, very much. You're welcome. For uh, giving us a guided tour yeah. of such wonderful history here. Thank you. Uh, I've learned so much about <laughs> Kimball that just floors me. I already knew that it was on the historic Oregon Trail. Yes. After that came the very first transcontinental railroad. And after that... Well, there's another thing that happened in there too. Oh. Um, Pine Bluffs, they, they call it Texas Trail that it ends basically up in Wyoming. Texas okay. Trail actually cut across this corner in Nebraska also. So oh, we're okay. on the Texas Trail too. Okay, wonderful. So. <laughs> and... Uh, then I guess there was the, uh, the first transcontinental highway called the Lincoln yeah. Highway, the first attempt highway at 30. having now. improved conditions for automobiles to travel long distances. And then, then and Highway 30 came through and then Interstate 80 came and through then and Eisenhower right. interstate system. Yeah, yeah. So.
There are some new developments that are coming to the community. Uh, there's a lot of Minuteman missile silos that probably don't hold Minuteman uh, missiles there's still today. Many. Oh, no. there are still some of those no, around? No, there's still missiles in the okay. ground. Well, um, well, missiles, yes, but not necessarily the Minuteman model. I right, think they've right. been yeah. upgraded. And, it, and they're due to be upgraded, and that's what's coming next. Yes. And so. there'll be over 10,000 people There'll be a lot and of people. various phases of that project, yes. and that's going. That's predicted to last probably 15 years the way the government operates anymore. Right. <laughs> yeah, they estimate 10, so it'll be 15. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I was saying. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you once again. You're welcome for uh, being such a wonderful host. And we got some. Uh... <laughs> that that's anyway. that's the automatic drain on the Cooper compressor. Oh, okay. You have to drain those manually. That one does it by itself. Wow. <laughs> a smart one. What an improvement. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you once again. And Nate, thank you very much for uh, giving me, getting me to a, a great source of information, which I hope is helpful to you as well.